Welcome to another edition of the Federalist Files. I'm going to be going over Federalist number five today. You're going to have the <clears throat> the topics are going to be a need for union to avoid faction, civil war, and foreign influence. And the uh, the title is the same subject continued concerning dangers from foreign force and influence. It's written by John Jay. The date was November 10th, 1787. So you're going to be looking at the same subject that we had for the last two papers that have gone over. And, and this is going to be the last one on this uh, specific subject. Uh, he gets really deep into it in this one. He starts, he, he comes out with a lot of historical references. Uh, he continues to exhaust his former point of of union to unite the 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 country under one federal government uh he begins by quoting queen anne's address to the scottish parliament in uh july 1st 1706 and uh just a little background information here it was at this time britain was weird the way it was ran there was three different territories technically but it was all under one monarch but each each territory had its own uh, parliament, which is what I was trying to name in my last uh, video, was the uh, the legislative branch, technically, of Britain. It's a parliament system. It's a parliamentary system. And then now, I mean, years ago, they had kings and queens, and that was their monarchy. Now they have um, a prime minister. I don't exactly know their system as well as ours, obviously. But <clears throat> at this time... It was weird because each individual uh, territory had its own parliament, but they were all under the head of one monarch. So, uh, Jay, Jay, Jay points to them as an example to be taken from because from pretty much from Scottish independence, uh, fight for independence on, which is the 1200s, if anybody knows of uh, William Wallace, the Braveheart movie, uh, the Scottish were constantly fighting the English, and the same thing with the the Irish as well. A lot of the time, the Irish was lumped with the English on that side because they somehow had some sort of jurisdiction over them. Uh, now from tw the tw late twelve hundreds, from William Wallace, and they lo he lost his battles. For independence, and then I believe they they gained their independence sometime in either the thirteen or the fourteen hundred hundreds. The uh, the Scottish. So I'm going to give you some more information, but here I'm going to start with a quote from her address to the Scottish Parliament, and when she speaks of union, and she states, and I quote, "An entire and perfect union will be the solid foundation of lasting peace." It will secure your religion, liberty, and property. Remove the animosities amongst yourselves and the jealousies and differences betwixt our two kingdoms. End quote. She means two kingdoms as in uh, there was England was combined with Ireland at the time. And then there was Scotland. And she ends, she continues to go on, but she does end here in uh, a quote will be enabled to resist all its enemies, end quote. So she 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 was trying to get across, she was accentuating this, that this union will be able to secure your religion, your liberty, and your property, which later in these papers, I don't remember exactly which, it's probably Madison, or maybe it's Hamilton, but they try to get that across that the the core purpose of government is to secure your liberty and your property. They say that in these papers. I don't remember exactly which one, but we will get to it. And obviously defend uh, each other from each other. And she means when that union will cause you to be able to resist all enemies, as in you will not have to. You will be much stronger, more unified together. And then the fact that you're unified and you're not against each other, you will be able to, you won't be inviting enemies 
to come into the country. And we'll get to this later in this paper. But at the very end, John Jay talks about that, which is a very good point, that he really thought outside the box that if if you were constantly fighting with all the other confederacies right next to you, what would you need to get the upper hand? You would need some sort of foreign ally to come in, just like we did during the Revolutionary War with France. With the with the French came in and they helped us fight off the British to gain our independence. It's It would be the exact same scenario if there's multiple confederacies. There's constant infighting going on. You're going to have to invite some sort of foreign ally in there to give you an upper hand. Which would be a bad idea because that foreign ally once you defeat that confederacy next to you can try to take a land or can try to take you down right afterwards and he'll i'll get to it later in this uh in this analysis here but just a little more information uh it was called the union of crowns in england when they when england Ireland and Scotland all combined the crown under one monarch in 1603. And that was called the Union of Crowns. And it was, but then they continued over the years, and this is why they ended up becoming Great Britain in uh, 1707 with the Acts of Union. And that's what Queen Anne was writing for to the uh, Scottish Parliament. But now they were still fighting and it was mostly civil wars between the british uh protestants irish catholics over land and power and then you know scotland would also uh get into fights because they didn't want to have that monarchy i think i want to say it was ireland wanted a republic but there was republicans you would call them republicans because they wanted a republic they wanted really just a parliamentary system just like the Articles of Confederation were, where you just have a legislature, you don't have any monarch. So they thought that was the best form of freedom, and that ensured the most freedom for the most people, rather than have that monarch. And the British wanted the monarch, so they would constantly be fighting these wars. And it was, and they were called the British uh, Civil Wars. And... Um, yeah, up until, I guess, 1706. It was the British Civil Wars. I read, I think it was the 1650s. 1650s. They killed off the king at the time. Those wars went on for years. And then they replaced it with a republic for a couple of years. And then I guess that fell. And they were able to establish some sort of peace agreement. And then uh, the son of that, that king, I think his name was uh, Charles, Charles or whatever, you know, the second, third, who knows at this point, they placed him back in power as the monarch. So there was constant infighting factions, and, and what Jay's alluding to is just, hey, look, he points at Great Britain as, hey, this is a great example for what to do and what not to do and what will happen if we continue to let this ensue with no strong federal government, with no uh, executive branch and no legislature or um, judici judicial branch that balance all of that together. Um, now, here's a quote I have from, from Jay. And this, this is when he was alluding to uh, Great Britain. He characterizes them, and I quote, Notwithstanding their true interest with respect to the continental nations was really the same, yet by the arts and policy and practices of those nations, their mutual jealousies were perpetually kept inflamed. And for a long series of years, they were far more inconvenient and troublesome than they were useful in assisting to each other, end quote. So that's, that's him just... Uh, really sum summarizing the history between all of those territories in Great Britain that they had their weird little treaties but at the end of the day they were always fighting each other it was always inflamed perpetually it just kept going on from from the 1200s up until the, the 1700s after I think it was they had two different civil wars over it um now, these contenders of the Constitution, they believe in the same structure that was going on in Great Britain with three separate confederacies. So they that was the Anti-Federalists, obviously, that he's alluding to. And uh, he warns that this philosophy would just 
it would cause the same infighting that Great Britain had because of state pride, economic jealousies, and the North being much more advanced than the uh, South economically. I think that uh, from from what I've read, it seems like, and this might this might be because or it might be attributable to the fact that the North wasn't as slave uh, driven, and it was much more innovative. So. This is this is just a philosophy of the way human nature works. On my part here, I'm going to try to uh, try to put into context best I can. But if you're telling someone, and they're they're a slave, right? That you take away the incentive, or not even, yeah, you know what? I'm going to put it in those kind of words. You have a place to stay. You're not getting paid. You don't have your freedom, right? And every day you do the average of. 10 wheel barrel barrels full of cotton okay now what would why for what reason if you know at the end of the day you're not getting paid anything extra you're still going to have a place to live and you still won't have your freedom what would make you do any more work than just doing those 10 wheel barrels nothing you would continue to do the same amount of work whatever would keep you in the good graces of whoever the slave owner was at that time, you would just continue to do that work. Now, in the North, where you didn't have, it wasn't as slave-driven at that time, and then, you know, they abolish it over time, it's really non-existent until then they have their big civil war, or what have you. So, in the North, if you're telling me, yeah, you know, you could do 10 wheelbarrows, you get paid the same, whatever, whatever... But if you can go and you can somehow double that work or you can one and a half, you can do 150%, you can do, you know, 15 wheelbarrows of cotton and you're going to get a raise. You, Why wouldn't you? It's an incentive-based system. It's just like when you look at a government job and a government job, this, this is how you create terrible government employees w- w- that are not efficient or effective is you tell them, hey, we're putting you on a... And this is supposed to be fair because of unions. Unions somehow make this fair, and it doesn't really make any sense. Um, But we're going to put you on the same pay scale as somebody else. This person's been here for 20 years. They're getting paid 100 grand a year in the teaching, let's say. You're starting at 50. You're not going to make that much money until you've been in as long as this person. So what is the incentive to do a good job? And what is the incentive for that person that's been there for 20 years getting paid that money to continue to do a good job? Because there is that teacher's union and you have that tenure. There is no chance unless if you go and you sexually assault a child or assault a child, there's no chance of you really getting fired. I mean, we had a scenario in my town where there was a gentleman that, uh, well, not, I don't even want to call him a gentleman because he's a, he's a piece of human garbage. But he did this, he was hitting on underage girls, sending them creepy messages, touching them oddly, and he ended up with all the evidence that was against him, all he got was his teaching certification taken away. At that point, he still has his pension, he's been in the system for so long, he's been there for at least, you know, 20-something years, so he's made, he's a made guy, he's a made man, no criminal charges against him, really no civil charges against him, so he gets off scotch-free, nothing. And what? No, oh, now he can't teach anymore. Like, he cares. He's done. It's over for him. So I think there should be some sort of retribution, but that's just me going off on a on a tangent there. But that system is not considered an incentive-based, merit-based system, is all that I'm trying to allude to. And during the during that time, the, seven, the late 1700s, the North was less driven by slave labor and more driven by just uh, regular workers in a free market. It was much more of a free market system. Therefore, Jay was portending that in the future, the North was going to be much more economically stable. I think there was also a lot more uh, natural resources in the North, and the South was really just made for crop and farming. But... um. I'm going to continue here on my next quote that I got here for from Jay. And I quote, Distrust naturally creates distrust, and by nothing is goodwill and kind conduct more speedily changed than by invidious jealousies and uncandid imputations, whether expressed or implied. End quote. 
So what he's saying here when he says NVIDIA's jealousies and uncandid imputations, imputations, it's it's not honest, is the uncandid, not honest imputations, meaning uh, like judgments, negative judgments, or negative, uh, you know, he's saying, what he's trying to say here is he's trying to say, these negative imputations or you're going to have a bad feeling about your neighbor and whether it's going to be expressed or implied or it's in your head it's there you have that it's it's like that that saying you say when you have oh the tension's so tight in here i can cut it with a butter knife it's just like that there's going to be tension because of jealousy because the person that's right next to you is doing really really well and because that and it's not something that is even shared in any way because there is no union and also then he, he also states i don't think i have a quote here for it but he talks about how these confederacies would be much more likely to go and create these foreign treaties and for, foreign uh commerce deals individually though so then you're going to also have more and more jealousy that stems from economic economic uh indifferences and inequis inequities so that's really what he's alluding to here and then he then he also states that americans will more likely uh find enemies nearby in nearby adjacent uh confederacies because of the distance between the states and europe because europe's going to be you know a whole ocean over the atlantic ocean over and those other confederacies or states are going to be right next to you. So, then he goes on, and I quote, Hence it might and probably would happen that the foreign nation with whom the southern confederacy might be at war would be the one with whom the northern confederacy would be the most desirous of preserving peace and friendship. End quote. So, really what he's saying here is that if this foreign nation it's exactly what i was saying before is that these nations would be more likely to find uh these these foreign nations to find friendship with one confederacy over another and in the middle of this war they would take sides and in taking sides you're you're gonna really just throw a wrench into the whole thing and he explains, he explains, and I quote, It is far more probable that in America, as in Europe, neighboring nations acting under the impulse of opposite interests and unfriendly passions would frequently be found taking different sides, end quote. So he just, he just continues to just slam this home. He's been talking about this now for three different papers. So like I said, it does get repetitious, and it, um, because of that, sometimes it could become lacking of of originality just because you're listening to the same thing over and over again but he finds different ways to characterize it over and over again just to kind of uh really just hit a home hit it home you know just really emphasize how important it is and then this this is where this is the home run hitter right here that i mentioned earlier and he states and i quote each of them should be more desirous to guard against the others by the aid of foreign alliances than to guard against foreign dangers by alliances between themselves end quote so this is what i was alluding to earlier and it's what he said in many uh in many different forms and formats He's just saying you're going to be much more willing to invite foreign alliances and foreign nations into our country just to fight your neighbor. But your neighbor is realistically you guys are kind of, you guys are kind of on the same team. And then in doing so, you really just uh, you cause dissensions, you cause instability, in and even commerce. I mean, in commerce, you cause instability, you cause instability in our governing system. What you're going to end up seeing is something like you saw in Great Britain, where they assassinate the king. And then they placed their own type of government in there for so long. And then, I mean, Great Britain was really lucky also, though, because they are an island. You know, there was maybe countries that would think 
and that's that's another thing in America that we really and they allude to this in in the later papers. We're very lucky to have the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean when we were a developing country, because to get to us, especially in that time, to get to the to America was just it was so cumbersome. It was such a pain, and it wasn't even worth it because by the time you got here, if we were ready to meet you with arms, you'd be you'd be tired. I mean a long journey like that would really take it out of a soldier. So that was another thing that uh, we were very lucky for. And and Great Britain also was, because if it weren't for that, and because they were so superior in terms of their Navy, uh, they, would re- they would have had some issues too while they were undergoing their uh, civil wars that they had. And then, and then the very last quote here, that uh, that Jay ends it with, and it's a it's a strong statement, and I like it just because it's one of those statements that you can like put on a T-shirt or put on a poster or something. He states, and I quote, and let us not forget how much more easy it is to receive foreign fleets into our ports and foreign armies into our country than it is to persuade or compel them to depart. End quote. So I'm gonna leave that there. Uh, really, he's just he's he's alluding to. How much, how easy it is to accept these uh, these enemy ships coming in or these foreign ally fleets that that and then once they're here, let's say you win whatever war you have, it's going to be difficult to persuade them to go back to their uh, home country because you got to understand at this time it was imperialist in a way you're looking for natural resources you were looking to gain land gain land disputes that's what most of those fights in great britain were all about those civil wars it was about land disputes it was over religion and something like half a million people died which at that time was a lot of people uh, a lot of casualties to have considering the population wasn't as uh, voluminous as it is now and yeah essentially you're gonna have a hard time convincing them to leave once they're here so we're better off getting that union, producing that stability. And uh, that'll be it for this paper. Uh, the next one's going to be different. Thank God it's going to be a different uh, author. Alexander Hamilton writes the next one. But we'll get to that one on Friday. Uh, this one's going to release Wednesday, Wednesday night. And I want you to like, share, subscribe if you like the content. If you want to email me, uh, thoughts, concerns, criticisms, if you have any questions, or if you have any podcast that you want to see as my direct message or like a special edition podcast that isn't related to the Federalist Papers, we could talk about other things, uh, politics, economics, stuff like that. Um, And do not forget to drop the mic, as in my name, on anybody you know. Let them know about the podcast. And that's really it. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on Friday.